there. I'm Gabe Drapos uh, from Pearl Health, and I have with me Ankit Patel, who's going to be speaking with us about the uh, history of CMMI, some of the uh, major steps forward that the agency has precipitated in Medicare, and some of the, the misses and lessons learned. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, just to start off with my background, I was a lawyer for a very brief period of time. Uh, but then went into uh, CMS in 2010, first on the hospital side, um, but then moved over to CMMI as that was getting stood up um, and, and had a chance to work on a number of different projects. I want to talk a little about just kind of CMMI and, and what it is for those folks who are not familiar. And, and, you know, if you think about the history of Medicare and health insurance in America generally, um, you'd almost say, you want to think about CMMI is it was almost like 30 years late to the game. Right. The, the way this all evolved is you had a Blue Cross program, you had a Blue Shield program, and for the most part, the way insurance networks and, and coverage evolved starting in the 40s is you had insurance coverage for hospitals, and then you had coverage and benefits for physicians. And so you kind of had this like bifurcated system, and, and that's kind of a unique feature of the U.S. of one system to pay for ancillary facility care, one system to pay for all the doctors that you're seeing. And when Medicare was passed, the, the law set up the program to just replicate that model. You had Part A, which is the Medicare Part A trust fund. When people think about Medicare that you're guaranteed, like you turn 65, you're guaranteed Medicare, you're guaranteed the Part A component, which is to pay for your hospital facility care. You actually have to pay a premium in order to buy the Part B coverage, which is subsidized and funded through a separate mechanism. But that's what pays for your kind of patient care you know, but if you fast forward to like the 70s or so, you start seeing these mergers between like Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And so now in the commercial market, these two separate entities kind of became one. And, and for us, we all think of like Blue Cross Blue Shield as like my health plan, right? We don't we don't make a distinction between hospital coverage and facility coverage. And I go to the hospital, my doctor sees me there, et cetera. A lot of these models that CMMI has been playing in, kind of one way of thinking about it is like really just it's the first time where you actually had a strategy where you're thinking about blending the part A and B dollars together in one and sort of one actuarial pool, one risk pool, and then thinking about how to like collectively manage those dollars. You know, the, the reality is, is that you see, you know, see I put out an article, um, I believe it was the New England Journal um, about two years ago, kind of doing a review of all the models. And if you kind of add up the total dollars on whether or not they were successfully able to uh, reduce costs, you know, the, the programs on net lost money more so than they saved money. Certainly an argument to be made that patient quality improved. Um, but, you know, the flip side of the patient quality is at some point if quality is improving, you would expect that to kind of reduce healthcare, reduce healthcare utilization. And, and you got into this interesting question around for the CMMI models, is the goal to just reduce utilization and therefore generate savings by reducing utilization? Or is it okay for us to say, I'm going to move services away from an expensively priced uh, facility or service provider to a less expensive service provider so long as the quality is good? So utilization doesn't change, but savings can still be generated. Um, and, and you know, within CMS, the agency writ large, you had a lot of different opinions. But in the Pioneer ACO program, we definitely allowed for, we didn't change pricing. We just said, for purposes of determining whether you generate savings, if there's an expensive hospital and a cheaper hospital, if you move a patient from an expensive hospital to a cheaper hospital, you're able to generate savings that way. And, and there's a lot of open questions on whether or not that was a good thing, that was the right thing, you know, and what the goal and, and the strategy should be. There's a big topic that we need to be engaging on around health equity. Um, and, and I think there's a concern about whether or not some of these models, and, and, and I will say beyond just CMMI, but also like even in the Medicare Advantage space, of whether or not in the process of incentivizing better care and better outcomes, we're also incentivizing, um, you know, going into markets where I'm more likely to be successful and avoiding markets that are harder. And, and, I, and I think there needs to be some sort of like acknowledgement that we need to have models that are addressing um, kind of the need for getting more of underserved, disadvantaged populations into value-based care models and for folks in these in this space to want to take on accountability um, for those outcomes. One component of that is really thinking about the, the quality measures. And, and it's, it's a, one of my passion topics, both on CMMI models, but then also on, on the Medicare Advantage side, 
is that I, I personally believe that there's been a little bit of a, of a unintended consequence that some of the quality measures in, in the way in which they are calculated will tend to incentivize folks to want to avoid underserved communities. I mean, if, if one of your measures is going to be blood pressure management, it's, it's not surprising that one of the calculations for particularly on the MA side, um, people think about is I don't want to go into markets where I'm likely to have to struggle to keep patients' blood pressure in, in check. But there is a lot of innovation that's happening in the MA space. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, I think everyone is looking to CMMI to do is to really start offering programs and models that, and, that, and potentially even communicating more of that to the beneficiaries to help, un, help the beneficiary community understand what they are getting through these models, what benefit is accruing to them. Well, I, well, I think, you know, your point is well taken that there are clearly a lot of benefits that have resonated for consumers and Medicare beneficiaries to transition them so rapidly as a population to Medicare Advantage. The reality is, is the Medicare Advantage has not uh, lowered the, the cost of care of those beneficiaries. Agreed. Agreed. And so, yep. you know, insofar yep. as we, we have a long-term Medicare trust funding problem and need to uh, come up with solutions to address that, um, we need to look to other models. I, I fully agree. And, and for what it's worth, I, I advise most of my family members to, to stick with me for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, walk us through all of that, Anki. Uh, if uh, you've enjoyed this discussion and want to learn more, go to pearlhealth.com and we have a wealth of resources available.